Welcome back. We got six lightning talks. We're going to start with Arne. Big round of applause for him. Uh, yeah, my name is Arne. Uh, I work for Red Pencil. You might have seen the sponsor thing. We, we come here kind of every year, um, but uh, we don't really do many talks. Um, this is one of our, you know, what you're looking at is uh, not Google Docs or anything. It's something we made and we're very proud of. Um, but it, the talk is actually not about that at all. I uh, just want to mention it because I do want to maybe give a talk about it next Emberfest. Um, what this is is an add-on that's quite complicated. Um, and I managed to uh, turn it into a V2 add-on. That's what you're looking at right now uh, as of this morning. So um, in the process, uh, I noticed I was, I, I ran into some issues, uh, as you do. Um, and I noticed I was uh, sort of repeating a lot of old mistakes uh, that I have when I'm faced with new technologies. Uh, and I wanted to talk about that. So uh, a bit of a cryptic title. Uh, but in essence, if you look here, on the left, you see basically the list of browser tabs that uh, is from last night to now. Um, it goes up. Uh, it also goes down. Um, so there was a lot of stuff. You see some SaaS issues I had. Um, I had some issues with Ember in in internationalization and stuff like that. The thing is, um, quite a lot of those issues could have been prevented if I would have actually seriously read the docs of the stuff that I was using. Um, and not just the surface level stuff, but um, you know, as we'll get into later, uh, maybe some a, a layer below as well. Um, and I feel like, uh, as uh, also the, the the first talk of this Emberfest um, really clicked some things that I didn't know, which I could have known if I would have actually like searched for it. Uh, so what I wanted to point out uh, today is that um, it's easy to like. To say, you know, uh, docs are, are kind of hard to come by sometimes. Um, they are maybe don't explain everything very well and everything like that. But as a reader, I feel like you also have a bit of a responsibility to take, to take it on yourself to seriously read what you're, what you're given, to look for more, and even to drill down into, uh, to even drill down into code if you have to. So I wanted to give some, uh, some examples. Um, I put here three things, collect, drill down, don't be scared of code. So collect uh, is an anecdote like here um, that, I, that I have. Um, so this is a blog post from uh, Bzurak. I don't know his name, but um, he is like a super Ember core person, um, which really in detail explains the uh, Glimmer tracking system. And what I mean by collect is that um, I have had to look for this blog post so many times um, because it is super, super nice to know what is going on under the hood of Glimmer. Uh, I don't actually need it like from a day-to-day -day work, but just having the intuition there uh, helps me so much in, in debugging uh, and, and teaching uh, when new people join the team. Um, so this blog post is essential, and I, I feel like you should the thing is, it's not so easy to find. If you just Google like Glimmer tracking or something like that, you're not really going to come across it uh, immediately. Uh, so when you do find blog posts like this, uh, you know, collect them uh, and, and so on. So that's that's one point. Um, the next point I wanted to make is, is drill down, um, and that is really like connected to what I was doing, like converting an add-on to V2. Uh, one of the problems I had was uh, all the imports were wrong. Like um, uh, I had to switch to rel relative imports. And I had to use file extensions and imports, and I was like, "That's weird." Um, I was used to, you know, glo like, like importing from the root, and there was some stuff going on like that. I didn't have to uh, put the file extensions there, but I was like, "Huh, you know, that's kind of I don't like that about about Embroider, or I don't like that about V2, or something like that." And I thought it was actually a, a V2 specific thing, um, but it's not. It's just the ES module specification, which I would have known if I would have read it. Um, so. That's what I mean by drill down is like, look at the technologies under the technologies you're using um, and, and actually just go, go read them. Um, especially for, for, uh, for V2, I was kind of confused what it was doing and I didn't really know. And I was like, hey, what if I just go to the rollup uh, docs? Uh, I have them open here somewhere, but yeah, here. Uh, and you know, they're actually great. Uh, and it really made a lot of things click um, in my mind just understanding things, uh, what people were saying, how things were working, and stuff like that. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm having these docs uh, open on the introduction page because I feel like that's a mistake I often make. If I'm, if I'm faced with a new technology, I'm like, okay, 
Let's go to the docs, quick start. You know, three lines of code to add it, four lines of code to configure it, and I'm done. And I'm like, it's not working. And it's like, what? Um, but if I would actually read a bit more, and if I would actually you know, take time to really investigate what this thing is doing, what its um, assumptions are, what its uh, you know, what design choices are, uh, I would <laughs> avoid quite a lot of debugging. Um, and uh, I would have a lot less tabs in my browser uh, sometime. Um, and then the third thing I wanted to uh, just mention is that, you know, uh, I'm going a little bit over time, so I'll keep it short, but um, it is very useful to drill down into source code, even of things that are well documented. I have here a tree of tabs about Ember concurrency because I was just curious about how their runtime, you know, uh, generator thing was working. Um, and I don't really need that. Like at the moment, I don't have any problems with Ember concurrency. Um, but it's, it can be refreshing to delve into uh, libraries that you use a lot, uh, some of your core libraries. I wouldn't suggest it for everything, but uh, to just really investigate what are they doing. Uh, and oftentimes, it's not that complicated. Uh, source code usually is, you know, it's just code, right? Um, some, th some things are difficult, but for the most part, you can just get there if you like invest an hour. And I, the point I'm trying to make is that that time is super, super valuable. Um, in the long run and, and for the rest of your uh, you know, development experience. I think that's it, that's all I have to say. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Wonderful, we'll do a super quick switch, I believe. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Mate from Croatia. First time joining uh, Emberfest in person. Um, I work uh, in Productive, we're a software as a service company, and uh, I work in a team in ab of about uh, 20 Ember engineers. Uh, today, I'm gonna create a component. Before I do that, quick show of hands. Um, I can think of three ways to do this. The docs are obvious and they say uh, use Ember CLI. Who here is using Ember CLI to generate components? Okay, there are some people uh, who copies and pastes some other components and then, yeah, a bit more, yeah, <laughs> I imagined. Um, there's also another way of creating it manually, like right click, new file, and then we create the component JS, create the template, uh, fill it in, but it's pretty cumbersome. Um, we went through a few paradigm shifts and some uh, some changes when uh, we create components. First, there was the classic uh, component signature and we moved to Glimmer. And the defaults moved as well. So the blueprint, if you've used Ember CLI, you know about uh, blueprints. Um, it also changed. So when you create a component, you get a new uh, Glimmer component now. But then we shifted for our code base, let's say, to TypeScript. Then also the defaults changed. You know, now need to create a component, component TS. And if you start copying and pasting existing components, which most of you here do, you might uh, by accident copy a uh, JavaScript component, which is not nice. Um, now in our code base at Productive, we also added Glint, which has a big fat signature because of the declaration merging at the bottom. And it's a lot of boilerplate. So it's something people usually forget. Um, that's why, uh, to make this thing a bit more friendly, what most of you said you do is you copy and paste an existing component. You would go here, right click, copy, and paste it somewhere else. Uh, since we start from the, from the Explorer, it would be nice if we could uh, gener generate the component right here. So I have created a nifty little uh, extension for VS Code where you can contextually create a component from the Explorer wherever you want it, if you have some deeply nested component structures. So you just go right click where you want the component, Ember generate, let's say I want the component, give it a name, I don't know, check box field, enter, and it uses the Ember CLI which is installed locally to create a checkbox field right here. Um, also, I've added some, um, some commands to the extension which can create a helper. Um, more 
of these would be very useful. Um, I shown this uh, last night uh, to Julian. He was very, very impressed. He inspired me to show this to everyone. And uh, about an hour ago, uh, here in the audience, I published it, so it's available for you to install. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right here. There are a few quick docs in there. So uh, the whole thing is open source. It's on my GitHub. Uh, I mean, uh, you'll, you can find it via the, uh, via the marketplace on uh, VS Code. Uh, the repository is right here. And you can contribute. I believe this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I would like to uh, get some better uh, code tooling in Ember, like other frameworks, uh, frameworks have, where you could also delete a component from here, create routes, uh, other stuff, you know. Um, even debug from uh, VS Code, some Ember-specific stuff like Ember Data, let's say. Um, and that's it. Uh, install, fork, contribute. Thank you. All right, Isaac's next. Well, in one year, that's much like paths. So how do we create projects that are maintainable and extensible? And as part of this talk, I made an announcement about code mod utils all the way down here. So what this is, is a set of tools and convention for writing code mods, and it's supposed to be a replacement for Robert Jackson's code mod CLI. Here is a repo. So if I, ask, if I ask you guys, what is a code mod, and I think you'll most likely think that a code mod is supposed to help you migrate a project from one old code. Yeah. <laughs> help migrate a project to a new code pattern. So that, that is the case for things like Ember code mod v1 to v2, so it helps you convert a v1 add-on to v2. But code mods can be so much more than that. So you can, use, you can create a code mod to lint your code, so that's what type CSS module does. It checks for CSS and creates declaration files. You can also standardize code patterns, so the R to signature, not only does it create the signature of code per glint, it also standardizes how you write the signature and a lot of the components. There are so many variations. It would be so, so much nicer if there's only one single variation for, for you to consider. And lastly, you can just also create code mods to create blueprints. So at Clark, we have a blueprint for V2 add-on that's very similar to Embroider add-on blueprint. The nice thing about this blueprint is that it skips the Ember CLI on also the add-on blueprint. So if there's an error upstream, it doesn't really affect us. And it's, it's really fast, uh, especially the test. So here is a CI for the code mod v1 to v2. And if you notice, the test takes five seconds. And under the hood, there is running 70 acceptance integration unit tests. Imagine how, I think, how fast the development number CLI and add blueprint could be if the tests were so much faster. So my call to action as part of the lightning talk is that I would like to see more, I'd like to see more code mods so that I can see what are the features that this code mod utils needs. And it'd be nice if we can rewrite some of the code mods that, un that live under the Ember code mods. They haven't unmaintained for such a long time. It'd be nice if we can rewrite them and rethink about how we, how we write code mods in the future. And also the documentation for code mod utils is, uh, is lacking. So if you'd like to help out with the open, con open source contribution and the documentation, especially using JS doc to document what, are, what, are the, yeah, what these utilities are, I think that would be really helpful. And also, there's an open question. For template tags, for GJS and GTS files, how do we parse and transform these files? I think that's an open question that to be investigated. So if, you can, if you'd like to help out, just reach out to me on Discord on ijle 2 And I'll share these two links so that you can check out the blog post as well as the repo. Thank you. Awesome. All right, everyone, Alberto. Hello, everyone. Uh, I, will be, I, I will try to be quick uh, because I Actually, got the whole morning trying to get these slides up, but I will just be quick. Uh, this is a like what we did after a few years of iterating on various uh, search UIs inside our big application that we use Ember, like in the front end, and uh, I mean, what I mean, in web and mobile. So I'm Alberto Cantu. Um, I currently am the CEO of Prismex, which is uh, a software company that gives uh, safety. Uh, it gives us software to manage safety issues inside uh, complex sites, you know. Uh, so I'm from Monterrey, Mexico. It's been a long way to get here. So I will just showcase some photos that you may uh, be familiar with in my, from my hometown. 
So this is those kind of deals we make there. Probably Heineken, you know, uh, it bought the biggest, uh, uh, I don't know, brewery. The next, the next Tesla factory is going to be in my uh, hometown, just if you have heard. And also we have the big, I mean, the best stadium in, in Mexico, which is also owned by BBVA, which is a huge uh, team here. So it's, re it's uh, an awesome stadium and we'll, be, and we'll host a few matches on, on next World Cup. So if you are around, let me know. So the problem we had is that we started using Ember Morse table at the beginning. I don't know if anyone is familiar with it to render out tabular data. It's awesome because you can just pass in like your column definitions, a do query, a callback, and the data, uh, and you'll uh, have a nice table. And you can actually get filtering out of the box really quick. So it was awesome at the beginning. The problem is when we started like uh, growing the application. We needed to persist the URL, I mean the query params with complex filtering, sort, sorting, pagination. Let's call this request state. We also needed to display the results in any way we needed easily. Uh, think of Notion. You can just filter any view and you can uh, see the, the same data in lists, Kanbans, calendars, resource timelines, tables, matrix, or whatever. So we needed something like that. We actually wanted to, to save the state of any view to in order to like boot it, boot from it uh, in the future. And we also wanted to, an, a way to easily change views and filter the data like widgets, we call it, or views. So I'm gonna just showcase what I mean with these problems and how they look today. Uh, so this is Primix. We make a digital twin of your site and manage your any security concerns inside it. If anyone has questions, we can talk later. Uh, so this is now our production application. As you can see, this is just a simple table. Uh, we are using behind the scenes uh, Ember table, which is uh, an awesome uh, library that can, you can just move the columns around. And also, well, I guess the, the big thing uh, I'm going to focus on is like, we have a lot of filtering uh, stuff going on here and we can uh, move across any of these uh, like views and just have filtering uh, out of the box. And it's also persisted in, in the URL without any issues. Normally you will, you will handle this probably in a route model hook or something like that, or a provider component. Uh, but I mean, there, there is a few issues with those. Uh, here's for example, our mobile view using the same uh, mechanics. For example, this filtering is the same. Uh, and we also, for example, use uh, resource timelines that you can swap between those without any issues and the filtering is the same. So I get, I get you get the point. Like we, we wanted to decouple the search mechanics from the actual rendering of the, and use whatever we, we wanted to, to show. So for example, this is another example. We, we are just displaying a number here, but we can also like filter and whatever. And we can have multiple of those on the same screen. I mean, this is probably easy for some, but it was a mess for us to refactor. Uh, I guess going back to the slides, we have to, uh, we have to place multiple searches uh, that work independently of each other uh, with their own request, request state that you can serialize and save. We wanted to roll back uh, if any user wants to discard changes or to f further uh, like filter data uh, and have custom adapters. Maybe you want to hit the server or maybe you want to hit local, uh, your lo I mean, Ember data in, in the store, you know? Um, well, we wanted to be able to reuse without compromising much, like the filtering uh, as you saw. Uh, the thing is that we are really, we were really tied uh, to table layouts with Ember Moist tables, uh, and also the states, the state of uh, the filtering state was persisted in the columns objects that you pass in. So in order to just uh, move between widgets that you saw pro uh, previously, you have to actually get dirty and access the internal columns and set filtering, a filter a string as you can see, so you can get the UI reflected and a new query uh, dispatched. Uh, so what we did, uh, we use heavily Elasticsearch for all of our dynamic searching and such, Kibana and, uh, for dashboards and such. So 
we actually made this, we love uh, Elasticsearch that much that we actually are using their style guide. This is a, an open source library we made that you can all access if you want. It has a, a lot of components, Ember components, using the style guide of, of uh, Elastic. And well, I found out that Elastic, as a search company, has a search UI uh, uh, headless approach to this. So I made a wrapper, uh, which is called Ember Search UI. The main thing is like you have a driver that drives the search. It glues up the, re the, the request and the response state and has only really three main responsibilities. Hold the current request state, which is basically what you want to send to the server to, to filter out the data, and the current response state, which represents uh, your current uh, results. Whenever, it, every time you dispatch a new request, uh, the on search hook will be called and you can return a new response state and that's pretty simple, that's pretty much. You can subscribe the driver to any changes so you can uh, update your UI. So with this in mind, uh, we just got probably, I mean this is the API, the request state for example. You got filters, search terms, sorting, and the response states you have for example uh, down below like results and res raw response and such. I will just get into the Oh, and this is the actions you can do on the driver, add filter, remove filter, clip filters, and such. So you just have to pass the driver around. So this is how you create a driver. You just define an object with an on search callback, and you just have to return the response uh, state. You receive the request state, which are the current filters, pagination, and such. Um, well, the, the, the add-on comes with a search provider component. You just pass in the configuration that we just saw uh, in this slide, like just pass that object. And you can do any, any UI with that. And I will just do a quick sample. For example, there's another component that you can uh, you get out of the box from the add-on is with search. You pass in the driver, and with this helper, you can specify which uh, portions of the state you are interested right now, and you get that yield uh, from the driver. So for example, this is a search box. It is using uh, Ember Paper. I don't know if anyone has used it. But basically, as you can see in the, in the value and on change, you are just like uh, setting new terms and changing over, over it. You can be sure that anytime you set a search term, a new life cycle will, will happen and your update will be updated. So with this in mind, this is for example a, a component uh, to show the results. You will just be interested in the result, the result portion of the uh, state. You can just iterate and create uh, paper items in this case, for example. Uh, and this is like an, an slider, say, uh, to filter a price. No? So you're in this time interested in filters, add filters, remove filters, add filters. I think you don't need that much in this particular example. But I, I think it, it makes the point. There is a slider and you can just in, uh, on change set new filters on it and you, uh, all the UI will be sync. And this is pretty much the whole code it takes to, to make a, a new like search UI. Just search provider, we have our search box the filter slider and the, and the results. We can like swap any of these UIs without having to think about uh, like passing down uh, all the callbacks that you want, that you need, or having to think about columns. So that's pretty much it. And if you have any question, I'll be, I know, around. Thank you very much. Then I think we need one more computer change, right? And you can already tell by his headset, he needs both hands. He's going to show us some live codes and demos. So please, Julian, take it away. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, I'm going to try to be as fast as possible. This is going to be a small uh, hands-on live coding session. My name is Julian. You can find me on Twitter uh, and Discord with the nickname Bartok, B-A-R-T-O-C-C. And the idea of this small lightning talk is to uh, show you how to bootstrap a V2 add-on. Um, thanks to the Adam blueprint that we've heard before. Um, I would like to say that building add-ons is not only, in my opinion, uh, for community add-ons that you publish and you want people to use, but you can also use this in your own code base. Uh, Pat told us that at Intercom, 
they had at the beginning a very big monolithic application and you can split your application and use add-ons internally to uh, modularize your, your code and split responsibilities. So I believe this is a good practice that you can use in your own applications. So uh, the important part, I didn't start the timer. The important line here is that you can npx Ember CLI and give the embroider add-on blueprint. Uh, I'll use TypeScript and Yarn here because this is the package I use. And I'm not going to do it right now because it's going to download all the NPM packages that I don't want to lose time with this. So I've just got a, a pristine repository that we're already on. And you can see that what the Blueprint does is, does is that it bootstraps a monorepo. Uh, you can say this by the private true here. And this monorepo holds two things. Your add-on, that's in the v2 talk uh, folder, and the test application, that's here. And the test application, Refers to references your add-on uh, in its dev dependencies. It should be down there, the v2 talk here. Um, so what you want to do after doing this is to start and see if your application uh, builds. So you yarn and you yarn start. And unfortunately, this is not going to work. You're going to see some errors. And this is because it's a yarn. Um, I used yarn. I believe if you, if you use uh, PM, PM, you won't get this, but just uh, for the sake of uh, presentation, and maybe it, this could make a small PR, you'll have to set up really quick uh, some stuff. So I'm just going to here add some changes to my Git repository and to my Git ignore file. This is, once again, yarn specific. If you do that and this is the other important line. You want to say in a yarn RC YAML file that the node linker will use the node modules. And after doing this, you can yarn again. OK, you can yarn again. And you're going to see that it's going to spend some time in the link step. The link step uh, builds the node modules folder that we'll know about. And uh, after that, we should be able to start our application and see it working. And what's important here is that a V2 add-on, you might know or not, is not built when you, you, when you consume it. Actually, uh, I'm sorry, is built when you consume it. Uh, on the other hand, a V1 add-on, you get the source code. And when you build your application, you also build your add-on. A V2 add-on is already built. So when it's published, you get on the NPM registry the build version of the add-on. Here, we are developing our application and developing an add-on. So we need to build the add-on at the same time that we are building the application. And this is what you see. Uh, oh, it refreshed. But you can see that there are several um, colors here. And it's telling us that it has built the add-on and its types. And it's also building the application when the add-on uh, rebuilds. And you get out of the box with this V2 um, add-on blueprint, you get out of the box all this setup that you can find in package.json. I have to go faster. Um, and the application is working. Now, what I wanted to show you is how to add a component, convert this component to a, uh, te from template only to back in class component to GTS. And maybe if I have a minute, uh, turn the application with Glint, but I believe it's going to be too short. So once again, let's go fast. Hopefully, I had some common lines prepared. So now we've got a a new component that you will probably generate with Tomex uh, VS Code extension very soon. And when you do this, your add-on lives uh, has this component uh, application, component file, I'm sorry. And it's going to, it should be, oh, I didn't do this. You have to reference your component in your consuming application. And there you go. All right. You should, we should be able to see this component inside the, the consuming application. So once again, you've got a repo, you've got the consuming application, you've got the add-on you're building, and the add-on blueprint brings you something that you can use if you already have a mono repo. You can pass a flag, uh, an option flag when you're building the v2 add-on, and it will just create the add-on inside your mono repo. So that could be useful as well. And we have the rendering. Now, if I want to uh, add the backing class. I could just do both of those. 
and it's going to work. I don't know how I should do to be fast enough because five minutes is already gone. Um, let's switch and just show you how we can um, enable Glint in our application. Um, this is going to be hard. If you want to enable Glint in your application, you have to you have to tell your consuming application what components it provides to your uh, consuming application. In the v2 add-on folder, you have here inside the TypeScript, because I generated the add-on with the TypeScript, you've got a Glint configuration and say Embaloos. And you need to have this as well in the test application. But it's not already there, so you should add this. And then in the test application, you would say in the source folder, yeah, that's one thing important to say. A V2 add-on doesn't have the add-on folder and the app folder. It has only a source folder, and that's very interesting because you do not have to add all those re-export files that Ember, generates, Ember CLI generates for you, but when you copy-paste a component, if you are doing this inside a V1 add-on, you oftentimes forget to add this re-export file. A V2 add-on only had, has the source folder, so that's pretty interesting. But inside the source folder, you've got your components, and you also have a template registry. This template registry here is supposed to help you tell your consuming application, hey, I am an add-on, I can provide you with this component and this component, and the consuming application will import this template registry and say, okay, I am consuming this application, it has this registry, this registry contains so many folder, so many components, and when you have Glint enabled in your HPX files, or GTS files, it'll know already that this uh, global uh, definition of a component has this signature, and you can go to definition in VS Code and see the arguments, the block, all the signature. Uh, it's too bad I don't have time to, to go further, but if you want more information on how to do this, just come to me. Thank you, all right. Wonderful. So yeah, no introduction needed, I think, but still a big round of applause for Anne for her talk. Welcome to my talk, Practice Makes Progress. And of course, as Ed already mentioned in his lightning Q&A, this counts for box and programming. Uh, but today I would like to show you art. <laughs> Uh, these are all the animals that I drew over the last year, because since 19 September 2022, I've drawn 365 animals, at least. Um, and what it taught me is that, just like with, wait, that was one too many. Just like with programming in art, you have these basic building blocks. So if I were to ask you to draw a house, you would probably draw a square, a triangle, and then some kind of rectangle on top of it. With these building blocks, you can create more complex shapes like a dog, just as you can do with components. If you can build a small component, then you can make that a bigger layout. The next thing you learn when you draw animals is things about proportions. So the easy thing with proportions are humans. They approximately have seven times or eight times their head size in their length. And then where your arms fall is kind of dictated. So there's a lot of convention in humans as there is in programming. Um, and if you feel comfortable with this step, then you can try faces. Faces also have a structure, but they are more prone to knowing what is wrong when you look at them. Do you have that sometimes with code, that you look at a code example and you go like, eh, but you know, don't know exactly what it is? That's what happens a lot when you try to draw people. Um, and then, let's see. Uh, at the end, you can draw something like that, which is a beetle, which has proportions and it has basic shapes, um, but it looks nothing like the basic steps. The other thing that I did during my 365 animal project is use different kind of tools. So there is watercolor, which is my favorite. Then there's also for the nerdy people, gouache, but I couldn't tell you, like I can tell you the difference, but you probably won't know, so that's represented in there. Um, it's kind of similar, but different. Then we have pencils and you could have ink and it's similar like in programming. You have these tools that you're comfortable with. Probably here it's 
JavaScript, may, maybe even more Ember than JavaScript. And then there are things like the stuff that the, the embroidery team is working on that might feel more like pencils to you. It's not something you're completely uncomfortable with, but it's also not something you will pick up just for fun. Um, so uh, I would like to invite you, especially now with Hacktoberfest coming up and with things like Advent of Code uh, in December or uh, CSS and J JavaScript Advent of Code calendars coming up, Pick something that you want to try to get better at. So maybe it's one buck a month challenge for the next year. Uh, and that way you can make progress. And the cool thing is that you can actually see it. Um, so if you want to know more about my art stuff, I'm on Instagram. If you want to reach out to me on Discord about contributing, uh, I'm on the core learning team, I'm Mintami, uh, and I wanted to include this goldfinch because it was also in Sean's awesome picture, and this is the one I painted. Um, so thank you very much for listening, and I hope you feel inspired to make progress by practicing. Woo.